Are you listening? My mother was one of those parents that was always about allowing me to expose myself to things. It was violent games, movies. I, I was never restricted. So, you know, even without a band, a part of me was like, well, should I be restricting? But at the very least, we should have these honest conversations because you know what's happening in Chicago? We have this rash of, of actual carjackings. And in my mind, if there's a young person who father and uncle played these games and they don't connect these games to true trauma. If you're a, a fully well-developed adult, you, you know that carjacking ain't got nothing to do with a video game, right? But what about the young people? To make it, you know, we have to make it clear in society that certain behaviors aren't acceptable. You know, we have to ask some question. You know, I, let's say I enjoy GTA, but I still want young people to understand that you have to keep this game in its proper context. Every year, violent video games are brought into the spotlight over their impact on America's youth. Recently, Representative Marcus Evans of the 33rd District of Illinois issued a bill that if passed, could potentially result in the banning of all violent video games. On today's show, we sit down with Representative Evans himself to discuss what led him to get into politics, the impact that video games have had on his life, along with what why he feels that this bill is so necessary. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our conversation with Illinois State Representative Marcus Evans. Representative Evans, welcome to the Nerf Report. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, I love to connect the folks. You are uh, officially the first politician to come on the show, so I feel like I have to ask the question, um, what made you get into politics? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm 36 years old, so I'm one of the youngerish politicians uh, in the state of Illinois and probably around the country. Um, when I was in high school, I was no good at sports, right? I was, I was slow and I couldn't jump and I couldn't dunk and whatever. So I got involved in uh, student government in high school. And then uh, while in high school, I started volunteering with some very prominent people. So I found mentors. You know, I believe, uh, I mean, you in media, sometimes you got to go and find your mentors. So uh, I found the guy, his name was John Stroger. He was a, a kind of a big shot in Chicago and I became his volunteer. And then I worked uh, as an assistant for another politician when I was 20 years old. I did that for seven years and I've been a state rep since I was 27. So about nine years now. That's extremely impressive. Now you represent the 33rd district of Illinois, correct? Yeah, which is the South side of Chicago and a part of about five suburban areas right South of Chicago. Good hardworking folks. Uh, I represent uh, about 60% in African-American, about 20% Latino community, and about 20% uh, white. So it's a diverse community, a working class community, a lot of single family homes, not a lot of tall buildings. It's South side of Chicago, so if you're familiar, you see bungalows, you see you know, community homes, uh, working class community, not, not a rich community. And uh, you know, that's, that's the people representing. It. It's home for me. I've always lived in the city. I went to college at Chicago State University uh, here. And uh, I'm, my side, other job, in addition to being a state rep, I'm a real estate appraiser. And I also referee high school basketball. I had a slight career in basketball in like junior high. And I was, uh, I, w I was on the, the bench warmers, essentially. So we were the team that got sent out before the game to warm the reps up. Um, so. <laughs> I can't say too much. Yeah, for me it was rough. I was uh, I I didn't even make the bench warmer. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in when you and I talked before this interview, uh, you mentioned that you uh, you know you play video games, and, and that intrigued me because you know it seems like for the longest time when you thought of the word politician, it, it was hard to imagine somebody playing video games. But you know you have AOC who's heading over to Twitch and becoming extremely popular over there. Um, recently, I saw a video of President Joe Biden uh, playing Mario Kart with his grandkids. So what type of games do you find yourself playing? Oh yeah, I mean, again, I'm 36. So I'm, I was always, I'm a grown up a game. I mean, I played Dreamcast, Sega Genesis, all the PSs, you know, um, you know, I was more of a sports fanatic, so I played Madden. Even now, I mean, you know, you don't want to see me on Madden 2K. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm one of the best ever, you know. Uh, so I play a lot of sports games, but any sports game you can give me, I might get the timing down. Uh, a lot of single shooter games, I don't know. I just never was good at them. Uh, even in the past, growing up, I mean, I, my friends have growing up playing GTA. I didn't play a lot of GTA. But of course I have played, so I'm very familiar with the game, you know, going way back to the San Andreas, to the original ones, I mean. So again, I'm a gamer, 
you know, based off my generation, you know, um, this is what we do. I think that, and we're going to get into the bill and kind of the ideals is, you know, I'm 36 years old. So again, I'm growing in my thoughts and my experiences in life. You know, I'm a father now. I just think, you know, we see the world differently than I did when I was 17. So, and that was, and that's really what prompted me to, to pass the bill and to have the conversation about some of the things that's going on. And I kind of relate to you there. And I mentioned this in my email was that, you know, I've grown up a gamer. I'm, I'm 31 years old. So I'm kind of in that same generation as you. Um, and while I've never had the experience of, you know, someone who wants to go out and do something after playing a game, I think that you can be a fan of the medium and still admit that, Having conversations or uh, self-reflection of the medium should be encouraged because we should just never assume that, you know, nothing should be changed and we should constantly be looking at ourselves of could we do better. Now, um, you mentioned the bill. Uh, recently, you submitted a bill to the Illinois General Assembly, uh, House Bill 3531. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of research on this and I've read the bill directly. Uh, I would love to hear directly from you. You know, how do you describe the bill? Yeah, what I describe it as, uh, I mean, it, it goes at the heart of the issue. And of course the bill could potentially have some First Amendment ramifications. It's a very, very tough bill from the start. And a lot of bills start like that. The bill bans the purchase of the game just all out. It's a very, very kind of hard charging piece of legislation. And that was my intention because, you know, legislation has a various purposes, not just, you don't just file a bill to just change the law, but also to invoke conversation because the will of the people is the law of the land. We determine what's legal and what's illegal. You know, if you go back 200 years, you know, slavery was illegal. You know, domestic violence against women was illegal. Restricting, you know, same sex love was illegal. And all those, those were laws, right? So the, the will of the people sets the laws. So, you know, I, I like my legislation to change law, but also be thought provoking and get folks to think about, you know, should we allow these games? You know, whether or not we enjoy them is one thing, but should we allow them? Should we have conversations about them? Should we be conscious of their impact? Now, that was really the, the episode around me fouling the bill. In doing my research, I was surprised to find out that there already is a law in Illinois called the Violent Video Game Law, and it was passed in 2012? Yeah, 11 or 12, yeah. Okay, now that law, as I understand, would restrict violent video games from uh, minors or anyone under the age of 18. The difference between what you're filing this week or last week uh, is that you're proposing violent video game, uh, I guess, ban across the board. Well, of course, yeah, yeah, the, the bill, again, and when we file legislation, you know, uh, the intended purpose is to get folks to have the conversations is, and to reassess where we are. You know, I think we're almost 10 years from that piece of legislation. And, and the question becomes, how are these games or how are the images and the things that we input impacting the current generation? It may not be impacting it at all, but it, you know, this bill has created, a, I think, a good robust conversation. Uh, a lot of very humorous attacks to me personally <laughs> in my, you know, I've, I've been called everything you can imagine. Mm. Uh, Cause the GTA community is very strong. Yes, and and there, but to but to your point, um, I, I've played GTA. I played it for about a good solid year, the most recent one, and there are a lot of kids on there, um, and that is something that concerns. I mean, I don't have kids myself, but it's something that concerns me um, because even as an adult, some of the things that I'm doing on there are questionable, um, and I couldn't imagine what type of impression that would be having on you know kids who you know brains haven't even fully formed yet. Yeah, and again, my my mother was one of those parents that was always about allowing me to expose myself to things, whether it's violent games, movies. I, I was never restricted. So, you know, even without a ban, a part of me was like, well, should I be restricting? But at the very least, we should have these honest conversations because you know what's happening in Chicago? We have this rash of, of actual carjackings. And in my mind, if there was a young person who father and uncle played these games and they don't connect these games to true trauma. You know, separating actual crime from entertainment, I think is important in the minds of some, not me and you. You know, and I think that's what I'm trying to get to some of the people who are in opposition of it. If you're a fully well-developed adult, you you know that carjacking ain't got nothing to do with a video game, right? I don't do I have to explain that to you. That's clear. But what about the young people? To make it, we have to make it clear in society that certain behaviors are unacceptable. Even in a free country, in a liberal society, we still have things that are acceptable behavior. And, um, you know, we have to ask some questions, you know, I, let's say I enjoy GTA, but I still want young people to understand that 
you, you have to keep this game in its proper context. You mentioned the carjackings, and um, I, I kind of looked up the numbers. So it, the, the number that keeps getting tossed around for the month of January was 218. Um, I also found a number that was uh, for the entire year of 2020, Chicago had something like 1,400 carjackings in the entire year. Does that sound about right? Yeah, and again, keep in mind, those are reported. So, oh, yeah. you know how crime works. I mean, it could be a person who, you know, but yeah, those aren't even the attempted jackings, right? Now, I did find an article from NPR, uh, and I don't know if you've seen this yet, but it's titled, Juveniles, Part of a Huge Increase in Carjackings Across the Country. Um, and they're actually interviewing the Chicago police. Uh, and one of the things that they said was that, you know, juveniles are involved in nearly half of the carjackings uh, in Chicago. Um, and that age ranges anywhere from 15 to uh, 20 years old. My question there is, there's currently already a, a violent video game ban in Illinois for anyone under the age of 18. Couldn't there be a case to say that, including it, that nobody can play it? wouldn't really help because the current law isn't really doing its job yeah but but again laws don't make people do anything you know laws are standards set in society and what we will accept i think uh people violate laws while we have prisons but laws don't necessarily govern behavior their suggestions and their, their normal standards uh if this bill were to pass for example or, or continue to advance and the conversation was to go we're, we're setting a standard that even us as adults we want to question this behavior at the very least, or set that standard. That's all. That's what laws do. So, uh, a part of my, the thought behind this is setting a standard. We have to send a message that this behavior is not funny, is not enjoyable, and there's no reset button for for real carjacking. Yeah, I was reading some of the punishments um, for carjackings in Illinois, and it's like, man, if you if you didn't realize the the consequences, uh, that would ruin your life uh, completely. You know. So it's, it's, I think you're on to a point that, you know, we need to make sure that kids know video games aren't real. Um, and, you know, the real world does have consequences. It does. And again, you know, we wouldn't have a slavery video game. We wouldn't have a anti-Semitic video game. We wouldn't have a domestic violence, a dog fighting video game. I mean, we already set standards. And not saying that GTA shouldn't exist because there's various factors of GTA. It's an exploration game. Yes, it includes carjacking, but it's other, I mean, it's other just typical violence in it. It's in other games as well. The bill doesn't say GTA. The bill is about violent games in general and bringing attention that this Chicago violence and some of this inner city poverty violence is wrong. We have to change it. And a video game clearly will, is not an all encompassing solution, but I believe a solution is a combination of many solutions. This is just one. I mean, this in the package of solutions, this is just one piece that could potentially be, or at the very least, the conversation of it, I think is helpful. Now, earlier on, you brought up uh, First Amendment rights, and that was something that I kind of found uh, is it seems to always be the line that gets thrown out when there, there's a conversation about regulating video games. Um, both the states of California and Washington have uh, tried to do uh, violent video game bans in the past, but they've been knocked down by the court. What is so unique or different about the current Illinois law that it allows it to stand the way it is currently? Yeah, well, I think, uh, again, because it's not a full-out infringement, it's more of a, you know, it's a, it's a small caveat. And when you get to children and children's protection, I think there's a lot of groups that support that. My bill is a tougher pill to swallow because it's infringing on adult you know, activity, and people hate that. I mean, people want to do what they do, about whether it's porn or strip club people want to enjoy their vices because you grew up to be an adult you don't want another adult telling you what not to do and i think that, and i understand that you know alcohol now cannabis is look i voted to legalize cannabis how could i stop video game the people want out people want to drink alcohol and cannabis and gta maybe that makes them happy and i've gotten messages like that you know this is this makes me happy and it makes it really i really love the input because a guy told me on the internet um that when he gets off work, he looks forward to playing GTA as part of his stress relief. So uh, adult freedoms are critical in this country. This country is based off that. Do what you what makes you happy as long as you're not infringing on someone else. And I'm taking all that input in. And uh, it's, it's been a great experience. When you file a bill like this, you know, sometimes the, the conversations, you know, are very helpful in understanding what's the basis of this country. And that Constitution means something to folks. I'm one that believes that the Constitution is a living document. 
that we should continue to reevaluate, but some don't. It, it depends on your uh, your view, and I love all views. That's what I love about this country, man. We got so such a diversity in views and looks and experiences. So it sounds like to me, you know, th the current bill that you submitted isn't as much, you know, this needs to be set in stone. It, it sounds more like you're just trying to start a conversation among your fellow representatives. Yeah, at the very least. Well, I think I don't own the law. You know, I think politicians understand that. I work for the people and I want to listen to the people. We propose ideas. All bills are ideas and the, and the, the process is to communicate with the interest groups, you and others. And if the love for legislation is there, it should move forward. But the, the hardest thing about some politicians, they take everything personally. If people don't like your legislation, you have to reevaluate. I put the idea out there proudly because I believe this could, could potentially be a solution. But maybe the conversation ends up being a solution. That's the thought process of, of bringing all those great minds together. Let's just say in a, in a different world, people would have said, you know what, we need to do that. And maybe the ban will go forward. But in this reality, people are pushing back. And I have a decision to make. I can push against the people and be a terrible politician, or I can listen to the people and, you know, reevaluate it. But the, the process is in the conversation and listening. The people who use profanity or if you use nice words, doesn't matter. I want to feel it because all of that input helps us make uh, great laws. Well, and that's why I was so appreciative of you coming on because, you know, uh, like I said, I live in Austin, Texas. And, you know, when I started reading about the story of, you know, the carjackings, and then I read that, um, a local organization, I believe, is putting security guards at every single gas pump to curb it. That's a world that I'm not familiar with. Um, so when you see an article of someone pitching something or a law similar to yourself, immediately you think about it in your world and you don't think about it in that person's world. Yeah, and again, like my mom lives on the south side of Chicago, my grandmother, and they're afraid of getting carjacked right now. I mean, this is a real issue, right? So does it bother me to, you know, to bother a few GTA uh, fans or look for a solution to protect my mother, grandmother, and the women and seniors in my community. I mean, I'm coming up with other ideas as well. This is the only idea. And that's why I want to make crystal clear. This is like, this is the, the, the all encompassing idea. This is the only the utopian idea. No, we're coming up with programs for the children. I'm working on funding for a community center and for our park district. We're looking for other, other solutions and a grand solution. This was just one of the pieces. And again, this is a piece that, um, at the very least in both conversation, even if I can't get it passed, because that is what this country is about. And uh, again, the, yeah, the diversity of the country, you're, you're, you're a guy down in Texas, I'm a guy up in Chicago, we're talking, we're connecting and sharing ideas. Uh, I've accomplished a goal. If, even if the bill doesn't pass, I, I, I still feel good about it. Now, I, I guess if I were to give you kind of any, uh, you know, my personal take on, you know, reading the bill, um, I do feel that there is a, a potential slippery slope inside some of the wording. Um, potentially the word of uh, physical or psychological harm to another human or an animal. Unfortunately, I was spit firing video games last night when I was thinking about our interview, and I feel like that would almost cover 75 to 85 percent of the video games in the industry. Um, is that kind of what your intention is, or kind of work me through your uh, thought process? Yeah, again, my thought process, when you're putting words down, and, and that's why we have discussions, you put words down and it makes sense, and the input is what changes the direction. Because you're right, as the as the days have went on, you start thinking about what could this potentially apply to? I mean, I guess in essence, it could apply to a Star Wars game. It can apply, I mean, there's, there's games that aren't necessarily inherently directly violent that it can apply to. But that's why I love taking in the input, and, uh, and that is the legislative process, having you know, this teenage boys from California send me a message about their input on legislation. I mean, this has been really, this has been such a refreshing thing because it's almost like the younger me is talking to me. Mm -hmm. you know, the process, you know, I, again, I was just engaging with a young, with a young guy who's a teenager and um, he's passionate about his ability to play these games and, and how he views it. And I told him, I said, you know, you're talking to a politician, you're engaged in the political process right now and he's like really i am i mean in his mind and this is what we're doing we're crafting legislation not just me but we, i think this whole country is and maybe we're putting uh, some clarity on how we want to handle these bills moving forward what what type of support are you getting from your your fellow representatives in regards to this bill are they willing to have a conversation about this or has the the proposal not even gotten to that point yeah it's forcing a conversation for sure uh, when, again, when you start seeing your colleague on national TV, national news stations, 
and pop it up in Austin, Texas. I mean, the conversation is uh is, is there, but I think um, most folks are drawing a line in the sand when it comes to the First Amendment. People want to people want to make sure we don't infringe on that because I think with a lot of fake news and all the things going on, I think people are saying, let's find another way to educate the youth and let's figure out how we can accomplish my true goal, which is ensuring that uh, they're not influenced negatively by entertainment. That is always the key. Because again, I'm, I'm in a different place in my life. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have this view. But as a 36-year-old man and not a 26-year-old or 16-year-old kid, you know, uh, I want to be sure that we lead the next generation better. And, and I think we should always reassess what we are and not say, uh, we can never change anything. Because where would we be <laughs> if we would have took that stand 200 years ago, you know? You mentioned before you're a parent, um, the ESRB is kind of puts out ratings for video games um, that kind of help parents dictate, you know, whether this game is appropriate or not. Do you feel in your position as a parent and along with being a politician that there's more that the ESRB could be doing to educating parents? Yeah, of course. You know, again, making sure, first we have to make an assumption that parents truly understand what, what they're doing. Like, give an example, when my mother bought me a game, she didn't sit with me and play it, you know? So most parents, they, yeah, I guess it's, it's violence in it, understanding it, having conversations about it. Uh, and then we have young, a lot of young people don't have parents. I mean, we forget that there's a large percentage of, of homeless children or children with parents with, with issues and, and challenges. So uh, there's a segment of children that aren't getting proper parenting first. And then even the good parents, you know, how engaged are they in the day-to-day the, the -day of a video game. Again, how many parents sit there and watch and say, you know, I didn't know he was beating that prostitute in the alley. You know, you don't know all these things. And make and making sure that the young people understand that these are not norms, again, these are entertainment. And uh, I think we can have a balance of enjoying entertainment, but understanding that these are not the norms and uh, you know, making sure that nobody believes that, that it's crystal clear that it's entertainment. I think Donald Trump is entertainment. We don't want him making decisions for my life. And uh, I liked him when he was a entertainer, but not a, not a politician. And I think that's I think that's a part of society that some some folks in, in the liberal space they fear. Um, and I don't think that's censorship because I think that's just a reasonable behavior in society. We do it when we want to, but I think we should do it all the time. Yeah, I think one of the things that probably complicates it most for parents is that video games are moving into a digital or a cloud-based environment. Um, growing up as a kid, if I wanted to rent or buy a new game, we had to go to Blockbuster. I had to hold the box up to my parents and then they gave me the, the seal of approval once they looked at the box. And those days are kind of gone. Um, now within the press of a button, uh, a minor or a kid could be buying games on their parents' account. Uh, and the parent really doesn't get that opportunity to, to kind of see what their kids are playing. And, and engage in a conversation about entertainment. And, 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 and the key to this is we don't know who's being influenced negatively or positively, or if they're being influenced at all. We don't know, you know. Um, there may be a young person, again, that may believe this behavior is normal, so they go out and do it. It, they could be influencing their friends, encouraging it. We just want to set a, I would like to set a standard that this behavior is clearly unacceptable. And, um, but now that interesting, I'm jealous of these children now because yeah, in our time, man, we had to really work <laughs> to do anything. I mean, this is amazing. Like I said, they just, my son is two years old, so he's not playing video games yet. But I do think about that probably what, and you start playing hardcore games at what, seven, eight? Yeah, yeah. Heck, uh, I think I read an article that was talking about there's an e-sports player who's seven years old out there. So um, that's just crazy. And they should communicate. And again, with the with the, with the the wireless headphones, you know, proper etiquette and conversation. I just think we just want to make sure that, um, you know, that, that as society becomes more digital, that it's still a good society. And just having those conversations, I think, is very helpful. Um, you know, I, it's some stuff that's said on e-gaming too. I played a couple times. It's kind of wild, you know. And uh, is that a standard we want for the future? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely a conversation that I think needs to be had. And um, I, I'm going to be following your story, man, for uh, very very closely because it's intriguing to me. Because I I do feel like I said in the beginning of the interview, video games are not set in stone. Um, it should be something along with all forms of entertainment. We should be looking at constantly reevaluating and and making sure that we're we're being the best that we can and we're leaving to your point the, the best generation that we can for kids uh, in the future. Because think about it, technology in these games 
have an even greater impact on society than they used to. Because, you know, again, uh, older adults like us are lifetime gamers, right? So we're, the, we're the, really the first generation who our whole life, these games have been a part of it. You know, I'm like my mom and it is a time. I don't really remember a time when I didn't play a video game, right? From, you know, I'm again, I'm 36, 31 years ago was what? 1990, the games were mm -hmm. existed, right? I was born in my consciousness. These video games have been a part of my life. And uh, I wish I had more time to play them now. I'm very busy now. But uh, I love gaming. Gaming is important, but gaming is going to have to be a part of, I think, uh, the national. We might, I think one day we're going to have a gaming committee in Congress because gaming is going to be such a part of the society. And that means gaming has a large responsibility. The industry makes is going to make a, a trillion dollars or whatever that number is. But do they have a, a role to play in society? I think they do. Well, I've got one last question for you, and hopefully this doesn't upset your constituents. Uh, what is the best deep dish? Man, again, I told you, I was born in Chicago. Uh, I was, I grew up in Chicago. I'm a real Chicago guy. Uh, so of course, the, be the, de the best deep dish is in Chicago. Let's just make crystal clear. But man, that's that's a tough one, man. I'm really gonna upset it. So, I mean, you got Zeno's, <laughs> you got, you know, uh, can I give you three? You just need one. Sure. Yeah. Top three. Top three. I mean, there's so many. You know, Geno's, Lou Malnati's. But I, I got to shout out Beggars. Now, Beggars, Beggars has. You know, you heard of Beggars Pizza? No, I haven't. The so Beggars Pizza started on South Side Chicago, uh, in the Blue Island Beverly community, and they got they got a great thin crust. But the deep dish is the real deal as well. You know, Lou Malnati's. It's phenomenal. Uh, Blue Malnati's, uh, I mean, you for me, they're more, they all over the place. And, and Gino's East, of course, you just can't go wrong there. But man, it's, it's some small piece of places. It's a place called Chuck's and Western. You got, uh, as I already said, Beggars. Man, see, you can't go wrong here, man. You, you, you can fall into some good pizza here. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in New Jersey and it was similarly there where you couldn't go wrong. I mean, when we would go to New York City for vacation, uh, Anytime you got pizza, it was going to be good pizza. And the chance of the time that I have been to Chicago, I've never complained about pizza. I mean, the deep dish is fantastic. We used to have Geno's here in Austin. Um, it unfortunately didn't catch on too well, but it was it was delicious. I, I genuinely wish they were still open. Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, I love pizza, man. But it's hard, it's hard living in Chicago, staying in shape. I tell you that. We got some <laughs> great restaurants, so... <laughs> well, uh, Representative Evans, I, I thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking about your bill. And if there's anything that we can do here at the Nerf Report for you in the future, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. If people would like to find more information about you, uh, where should they go? Yeah, my website is uh, repevans.com. I'm really active on social media. Again, like I, I feel like I grew up on social media, you know, so um, you can search me at Marcus C. Evans Jr., uh, now I got like a general name, so you got to put Marcus C. Evans Jr. Uh, and then I'm on Instagram, Rep Evans 33. So I, I, I try to respond as much as I can. You know, hit me up on social media. And then I think we should celebrate the fact that we have a generation of politicians who game for real. You know, I think that is something that we and that who understand gaming. And I think as they get older, those folks will start reevaluating their, their thoughts on gaming. And I think it's going to really be a, a national conversation. I may just be the beginning of it that. Like, I think the previous person who filed it in 2012, I think she's like 50 something years. She didn't grow up playing video games, right? She doesn't understand. But you have a generation of folks who are parents now, and I think they're going to be thinking a little different about the games in which they enjoy. And uh, I think it's going to be an opportunity for the industry to to, to appeal to their, to their old customers and new adult customers as we have children and, and such. So I think that's a good opportunity, man. It's not a... This is going to be good for the industry because some of us still want a game when we have time. Yeah. Well, it's definitely an important conversation that needs to be had. Uh, again, Representative Evans, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, if you're interested in checking out his information, please head on over to his website, Twitter, or Instagram. And until next time, this has been the Nerf Report. Thanks so much for watching. Hey, thanks again for checking out our channel. If you like what you saw and you want to see more content just like it, which who wouldn't, uh, hit the subscribe button right there. And while you're down there, hit the like button. Maybe even consider becoming a Nerf Report best friend, just like the people listed down below did. In fact, don't you want to see your name there? I know I do.